Okay. Hi. <laughs> How everybody. are you, Anson? Good, good. Everybody, good. thanks for joining us today with yeah. my friend Kira Davis, who's coming Hi. out with a new book. I have to say off the top, I think this is my first time interviewing anybody in any medium, so oh. you're with me. Okay, well, I'm actually really impressed by that. I thought you were going to say this is the first time that you've read um, erotic fiction, which... <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not the first time I've read erotic fiction. Oh, okay. Well, good. <laughs> I'm a very... Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm excited I'm to be your first. <laughs> I'm well-versed in A.R. Rock Lauer. There you, oh, oh, well, then there you go. Yeah, actually, I've read all of the beauty series, so that's yeah, how I started. Yellow. Yeah. <laughs> Well, no, I am. I am honored to be your first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey. <Right. laughs> um, I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm. I'm. I'm always really excited just to sit down with an author and ask them about their process because I, of course, dabble. It's my writing is my. Um, I always tell my students you have to have something other than acting if you want to stay sane, <laughs> and so writing has sort of become that for me. And so my first question for you has to do with the process. You know, I what I routinely do to force myself to focus, uh, and, and I, sometimes I don't even know what's going to come out or what I'm going to be working on, but I, I write in my calendar, you know, tomorrow from noon to 5, the Lincoln Center Library. So, and I get my butt up the Lincoln Center Library, and I sit myself down, and, you know, there's little distraction. And I'm also, I'm surrounded by people who are also focused, and that seems to help me. So... What really? What is your process in terms of just getting the work done? Um, I seem to respond very well to stress. <laughs> um, there's something about my first book was I wrote during a really stressful time. And I needed that release, and then after that, you start getting deadlines. And li I'm one of those people that needs I need something to mo to a gun to my head type of thing. I'm not. Um, and whether that gun in the head is emotional, like I have to get this out, or I have to, um, there's, you know, there's there's things I need to say, and um, it's extremely important to me on the emotional level to get them out on paper in one format or another, or it's the issue of this is due in a few months and I have to sit down, and when you have that pressure, um, you know, and you're sitting down in front of the paper, and I start writing, and I don't have I'd like to have a more regular schedule, but it's a little bit more challenging sometimes doing that with a kid, and particularly when you start taking in breaks and such. Um, but I try to write, certainly, when he's in school. That's absolutely writing time. Frequently, it goes on further than that. And I just start writing whether I have really good ideas or not. Usually, I could frequently write like 10 pages of horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. Things that um, wouldn't pass a, you know, a sophomore paper, you know, but then by 10, 50 pages, they'll get a gem. You know, I'll get a gem. And from there, I can erase that and work from that gem and expand. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the schedule, again, the deadline has something to do with it, but also the, um, and my son's school schedule, and just sitting down at the computer and writing no matter what, but I need the pressure. I'm not. I'm not kidding. I, I need. I need that. So it's the same way. Yeah. I. You know what I do sometimes when I'm writing a play? I just. Mm -hmm. I just arbitrarily schedule a reading. Right. Right. You need exactly. You need something breathing down your neck. I read this great little thing someone put up on the computer saying that creative process, you know, the first like 80% is just, you're just kind of messing around and then, you know, there's around 10% where you're getting a little stressed and that last 10% you're writing and crying at the same time. That's me. That's my creative process, <laughs> that 10% of writing and crying. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you need, I need the gun. So, that's my and process. I know for me, you know, when I'm, when I'm writing a play, one of the things that Another part of the another part of the thing that keeps me that, that really motivates me is that the feeling that and what's great about plays is that I know that I'm going to be giving this to people right to interpret and I it's kind of there's something about it that's a little bit like giving a Christmas gift right and, and so I end up sometimes I end up writing with specific actors in mind 
And so I'm wondering, do you do the same? Sometimes. Um, I, when I write these books, you know, I frequently will visualize an actor. Um, I don't necessarily think about the parts that they've played beforehand, but just in terms of getting a visual for that character. And I, I will say, you know, my first um, book within this genre, Just One Night, I have a lot of readers who, if it ever gets to film, they want you playing the notorious Mr. Dave. Okay, so, um, but I get, you know, I, I will work with that imagery. But the people, the people come from different facets, from within me or my imagination, the personalities of those people. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's different than writing, you know, a vehicle for Adam Sandler or something like that, you know. Um, so, but I do think about, I'm not the most visual person in the world. I all know that I could, when I write about places, I write about places like New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, or towns, you know, I, I, I have a visual reference, and I really use those places as characters. Same thing with people, I need to have a visual of a person. So if I'm thinking about, um, like, Josh Holloway, a visual for him, for like a character like Lander, and I could think about that visual, but the part itself is is separate from that. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, hopefully, you know, with as you know, the good actor, then they'll be able to fill that role and and become that part rather than the other way around. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully. But so that that that's. Uh... One of the things that struck me about reading this, and I'm 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 up to I think I've read the first four chapters, oh, wow. is, is uh, you, you know the first thing that struck me is that you just I, I was like damn her because you just you make it look so easy and I know <laughs> it's not you know yeah. it 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 re it reads so fluidly and that takes mm -hmm. a lot of chiseling and a lot of editing. <laughs> And pe yeah. I think most people who don't write don't really realize that. No. But, and and I think that like if I, if you if you take Cormac McCarthy, who I'm a big fan of, if you look mm -hmm. at his early work and then look at his later work, his later work is infinitely more accessible than his earlier work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. In many ways, my earlier work I think is is simple. It's much simpler. It's much simpler. It doesn't um, than my later work, and right. in that way, it's more accessible. But I feel like with these characters, um, it did take much more crafting in terms of giving them, you know, a level of depth, depth and complexity that I really wanted to bring to this. Because for me, in this genre, that complexity and depth adds to the sensuality. You really need that, you know, for me. And for me, that's that's sexy, and so I it does take a lot of crafting. It's like you know, it's not something that you just you know throw out there. And I don't think people realize that. I think that they think, oh, you know, she's just such an you know, she's got this like magic trick, this magic trick talent, right? You know, <laughs> and you just sit down and throw yeah. it out there. And I don't know very many authors who. I don't know any authors who have that magic trick. And if you've written plays, I mean, you know, you know, it, and I know you've written plays. So I'm like, but the dialogue is to write a dialogue in and of itself is a is a different kind of challenge because you're not writing how people normally talk. You're writing in a way that sounds natural, that cuts out all the extra stuff that you don't really need to move your story forward, without it sounding. Um, well, without it sounding like you're doing that. Okay. And it's so just that is in and of itself a, a big challenge. And then in novels, what you have to do is you have to take the place and make it part of the story. You have to keep the reader in the sense of place. Mm -hmm. And you have to do it without taking them out of the story. You can't just say, and remember, they're still in the restaurant, you know? Right. So, that means that you have to find a way of weaving the imagery into the story and the action. And the authors, you know, um, you mentioned 
um, Anne Rice's version of the her erotica series. But Anne Rice is extraordinarily talented doing this. When if you read any of her books, you can really see the places that she writes about become part of the story. Mm -hmm. um, F. Scott Fitzgerald is another author who was spectacular at that, really taking the settings and making it part of the story. And that's um, that's not something that comes naturally to me. I actually read those authors before I start writing so that I can kind of learn from them. You know, Andrew Lytle, who I became a friend of right before he died, mm -hmm. was... Um, very few people know this, but he was an actor before he was a writer, and he was he was in the first graduating class of Yale MFA, oh. and, um, and even did some shows on Broadway. and And he credits his acting experience with being the biggest influence on on his writing and his his sense of delivering the five senses to, right. to the reader. Um, so before we go any further, uh, for the sake of, of our, our, our viewers, could you give us the what we call the elevator pitch for your book? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so Deceptive Innocence is about a woman who goes by the name of Belle Dantes. And her mother was um, convicted for a crime, a murder that she didn't convict. Um, didn't commit, and she actually committed suicide in prison. And Belle is hell bent on getting revenge for those who um, actually committed the murder or behind the murder, and she feels set up her mother. And she feels that it's the Gable family, this very powerful, rich banking family, who did it. So she's going to tear them apart from within, and the first thing she's going to do is seduce the youngest son. Lander Gable and get into that world and destroy them. But Lander is a much more complicated person than she imagined. He's not just a villain. She finds herself being feeling connected to him and that adds a certain level of confusion in terms of what her need for justice versus that connection. And also the fact that in many ways Lander is the first person who's really gotten her in touch with emotions other than anger in years because mm -hmm. that's she she is to quote the book inspired by mad rage that is her whole raison d'etre and so for her to allow herself any other level of emotion in some ways almost challenges the identity that she's created for herself that she's holding on to so it's a story about again. She's it's revenge, and it's uh, you know it's erotica, so it's got the passion and the romance, um, but it's also the development of this character and finding out who she is slowly but surely. In some ways, as she finds out herself. That's great. Um, let me go ahead and remind our audience: if you'd like to submit questions, uh, yeah. please do so right there on the page. Uh, but please keep them specific to Kira and her work, and uh, we'll try to read some of those in a few minutes. Uh, the, th the first thing that jumped out at me in the, the prologue of your book uh, is something that I really appreciate in literature is, uh, and I don't think it's necessary to use it, but, but, but the homage to literary tradition, uh, particularly in, in the sense of, of myth, and you use Roman and Greek, uh, mm -hmm. a Roman and Greek key yeah. to your character, which mm -hmm. I've been interested in the in the, the early Roman and Greek myths since I was a, a kid. Right. Um, is, that, is that a particular interest of yours, or have you, have you, have you learned about storytelling through Joseph Campbell or through, or through just reading the myths themselves, and, and uh, is that somewhere you go for inspiration regularly? Um, I, I love the Greek and the Roman myths. Like you, I find them just fascinating, and I love the idea of, of tying that in. And really, when we look at storytelling, that's where you go back to when you're when you're looking at how how to construct these you know these characters and these stories. I mean, that mythology really, I think, is the foundation for most of the stories, certainly within Western culture and to a degree worldwide. Um, so there's so there's that, and I and my own passion for that, um, I think, is reflected in this book. Um, in terms of learning storytelling, 
You know, it's funny because you know I did when I was in college. You know, I did in high school and college. I did acting. Went to you know I went to ACT and such. And I was not not a great actor. Okay, I mean I might have been oh you know okay, but not great. <laughs> but when you learn to delve into those characters and you learn and you start studying scripts, there is no better training for being a writer. There just isn't. There just isn't. And so really, I mean, when you talk about, you know, where I really learned storytelling, I mean, Shakespeare had a lot to do with that. Um, mm -hmm. The stories of Shakespeare, I mean, you know, from Hamlet to Richard III to Titus Andronicus, I mean, these are real stories, you know. And then, you know, you move on um, even to, you know, the existentialists, like, you know, No Exit is such a, I mean, still one of my favorite plays, you know. Yeah. Um, Arthur Miller, I mean, these are... These are plays that I you know read and reread and studied, and I really feel that it's from plays that I learned the art of storytelling, and from acting, um, good or not, <laughs> that I really learned the art of of character development. You know how you know you know what um, Faulkner said that, mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of his life. People asked Faulkner what he was reading. If he, mm -hmm. he didn't read any of his contemporaries. Really? He read Greek tragedy. That makes sense. You yeah. know, I mean, because again, these are the foundations. It's like you look at these stories of you know these these vengeful gods, right? Who are more human than any deity that we really worship today. You know, I mean, from no matter what your religion is, the Greek gods these were these were people, people. Okay, <laughs> they were in it, and um. And their stories all have to do with, you know, from deep emotions of, you know, of love and anger and vengeance and, and pain. It's all there, you know, and this this driving force, this narrative of the conflicts within between the um, the gods and the deities and the connections to human beings and so on and so forth. There, it's great story. It's such a rich mining ground, mm -hmm. and. I don't see how you can look at anything and not see that. And I don't think that it's, I mean, when you look at that mythology and then you look at Greek plays, you know, it's like there, there's an intrinsic connection there. There's no way to really separate that out. And so that was really the beginning. Um, more so really than, you know, before we didn't, you know, there was storytelling and fables and so on and so forth, but really structured storytelling, it was in those Greek plays, which then became the Roman plays. And yeah. So, and was, yeah. I was also, I mean, I was also taught that if you really want to begin mm -hmm. understanding Western literature, it, you have to have a working knowledge of the Old Testament. It's not a bad idea. I mean, you know, I... Um, reasons, I think. Yeah, I've 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 read them both. <laughs> and, um, you know, I actually because I did a um, I ended up with a business and humanities major, um, and one of the classes that I took was was basically studying literature around religion and God, mm -hmm. and there's no you know there's no way to read to read those stories. And I mean, and to read the Bible and not see a real clear—I mean—and really interesting narrative. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have to be religious to see yeah. that, right? Of course. Yeah. Of course. So, and I really, you know, I think one of the biggest mistakes that secularist will make is saying, "Oh, you know, well, I'm not religious. I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to read this literature." It's that to me, that's a little bit like saying, "Well, you know." Um, I'm Jewish, so I'm not going to go into like the cathedrals in Europe. Of course, I'm going into the cathedrals of Europe. They're beautiful cathedrals. Whether I follow that religion or not, that's not the point. They're beautiful cathedrals. And you know, I and like I said, I've I again, I'm Jewish. I I've, I've still read the you know the New Testament. I've read um, all of that, and I'm not a particularly religious person, but that's not the point. <laughs> um, you have to expose yourself to it. It's just part of our culture. It's part of our foundation. To deny that is to not deny what's right in front of your eyes, and you know, to say it's it's no better than 
denying science in my mind. It's like you, it's just yeah, part of what's built us up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we got some great questions. Um, let's ask, uh, I believe this one is from uh, Karna Gunn. And um, it's a good question. Uh, Kira, what, what made you decide what made you decide on this genre? Well, I didn't exactly decide. Um, what, <laughs> what happened was um, the I had worked with this editor um, at Simon Schuster before when I was writing um, these kind of fun murder mysteries for Harlequin, and he moved to Simon Schuster and said, Hey, you know, you want to do erotica. Mm. But I had thought of it before he he proposed it to me, um, and this was before the whole. I mean, I even before the whole Fifty Shades of Grey phenomenon. It was really clear that um, erotic fiction, erotic romances, were taking off, um, and that this was a growth area. And part of that is ebooks. You know, I mean, people don't necessarily want people to see the cover of. Um, mm -hmm some very sexy thing when they're on the subway, but if you have your <laughs> iPad, <laughs> they feel a little more comfortable. Um, so that's really helped. But also, I just think that it's just a fun, I mean, it's a fun escapist area, you know, and that you can do so much for it. I mean, I don't do, um, and I don't do straight up, for lack of a better word, I don't do straight up porn, um, where it's like it's just about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one girl, three guys in the cabin in the middle of the woods, right? <laughs> like, um, I don't do that. <laughs> um, I actually write a story, and there just happens to be some really explicit sex scenes in it, and right. that becomes part of it. Um, but that's one of the things that's really happened with erotica, and I think, I shouldn't say it's just happened, because if you read things like Emmanuel and Belle de Jour and even the story mm -hmm. of O and all that, I mean, those are stories. Um, so, you know, you could have any of that. You know, you can have the, the cabin, you can have this, you can have that whole genre, and it's still, you know, it's fun and it's exciting, and women tend to like it. <laughs> so, um, so that's how I came about to it. Um, have you, have you, are, you, are you a fan of an, an ice nine? Yes, yes, absolutely yes. And um, one of my favorite quotes is actually from her. Um, and if I've misattributed this, then please somebody tell me, but I'm 99% positive I'm right. Um, life shrinks and expands in proportion to your courage. And um, which is something I really, really believe and live by. But um, I've read, you know, I've read her, I've read the, her, the diary, the story of, you know, her and Henry Miller. It's, um, she's... She's a sexy writer. Even yeah. when she's not writing about sex, she's a sexy writer. Yeah, I, 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 we were uh, I, the university I went to for undergrad. You were you had to take a language through fluency, and I'm mm -hmm. I don't have a linguistic mind, and uh, I, I took Spanish, and I was just utterly mm -hmm. bored until we started <laughs> on nice mean, and then suddenly I got very interested in Spanish. Right, <laughs> exactly. That's what you, you know. It's funny because. For my other books, and I have like the mysteries that start with titles like Sex, Murder, and Double Latte, um, I have a friend or a, a reader told me that she was teaching those books in her English as a Second Language class. I'm like, well, that makes sense because, you know, when you have a book titled, you know, Sex, Murder, and Double Latte, that's probably more interesting <laughs> than a textbook. You know, so yeah. I, I get that. Um, but yeah, I. Oh. And I'm and I but I'm with you in terms of languages. I was an utter failure <laughs> in that in college, but I really tried. So. Let's go to another question here. Donnie Lee is asking, uh, Kira, your your writing does flow so easily. How long did it take you to finish part one of Deceptive Innocence? Oh, um, well, let's see. I. They do, they're not giving me real long deadlines these days. Um, this next book I have a lot, but um, or more than I normally do. They're giving me a couple of months um, for each one of these books. Now I had a little bit longer for Deceptive Innocence Part One. I had um, probably about three months versus the um, one to two that I had for the others. Um, but 
even so that for me that's that's a little tough. Um, and there were definitely rewrites and struggles and lots of tears and <laughs> lots of working really, really, really late into the night. You know, there are authors like you know Stephen King. Um, he's notor I mean, he's he's famous for being able to just just. I mean, write. I mean, just kick him out. It's amazing to me. You know, he writes a book a month, basically. I'm not Stephen King, <laughs> um, and so I needed. Um, again, it took about three months um, to write that, and there were rewrites, and um, and I didn't get to do really anything else during that time period. Um, ideally, I usually like to have a little bit more time, but it. It did work, so um, I'm I'm happy with the work, and again, it was just a matter of sleeping less. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, how about this one, um, Anson and Kira? Do you have many ideas that come to you during sleep, um, and then find your writing and adding to these, adding to the story from the thoughts you had while sleeping, or while sleeping and being Awakened during sleep for, with an idea. Yeah, um, my dreams are way too crazy for me to really do much with them. Um, but I like the idea of um, I, I like the idea of, of incorporating dreams into my novels. I frequently do that. Uh, but no, if I if I took if I took my actual dreams, they'd be a, a, a mess. I'm yeah. not. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Right. Is it, no, that just it doesn't it doesn't work. It's like I seem to my last year I think I was sleeping in a museum and I was taking the room that had just been occupied by I think Tom Cruise. It just wouldn't work. So, like, so, like, I don't know, how about you? Do you get do you have dreams that can turn into narrative? I'm 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 working on a um, a uh, a pitch for a a novella to possibly become a graphic novel that is entirely play, uh, based upon a single dream, but I've, I've really? extrapolated it. I've extrapolated it out, yeah. yeah. Oh my god, that's fantastic. That's all, I think that's maybe the only time that's ever happened. Okay, well I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for that pitch-worthy dream. <laughs> okay, here's a, here's a good one. Um, this is from Russia. And I oh. can't pronounce this person's name. Okay, I'm hi, Russia. And Kira, what are your favorite detective novels? Um, I am a big Elizabeth George fan. Um, the Detective Lindley stories, I, I love those. Um, so that's definitely that's definitely on the top of my list. Um, I do actually like um, the Conan Doyle Sherlock Holmes books. I, I do like those. Um, but let's see, what else in terms of Detective. You know, I will say for the Sex, Murder, and Double Latte books, um, one of the things that, or the Sophie Katz books, I should say, one of the things that inspired me was um, was the Jan Ivanovich books. Um, the uh, Stephanie Plum books were just fun and light and escapist, and that's what I really needed at that point in my life, and that's mm -hmm. what I tried to provide with Sophie. How about you? I really like, um, and I'm not sure it can be billed as a as a mis as a detective novel. It's it's certainly I've certainly found it in the mystery category before, but when it came out, it was a hit when it came out, and the 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 sort of elevator pitch for it was a mystery novel where you know who did it in the first chapter, and oh. that is uh, can you guess what can you guess what book it is? It came out in the night. Uh, yeah, I'm never gonna go. 93, I want to say. Oh, no, not going to even try. Not even going to try. The Secret History by Donna Tartt. Oh, God. No, I should have gotten that. I'm just like, I'm almost finished with The Goldfinch. And um, that, yeah, that really... The have Secret you not read The Secret History? Not yet, no. Oh, no, oh, no. I know, that's what i got to do. Because I am in love with The Goldfinch. I mean... Is that hard. Donna Tartt? Yeah, yeah, it's her latest, and it's oh, amazing. Really. It's amazing. I actually, I, I've been sort of proselytizing this book. Um, Talk about somebody who writes slow. Oh my God! Yeah, like every ten years, and I am so jealous. I'm, I'm jealous. I'm jealous of the time. I'm, je and it's, but you know, but she comes out with these masterpieces. <laughs> They're masterpieces, you yeah. know. And I, this book is. 
I say 700 pages or something like that, and it's every page is worth it. You know, it's not like you're saying like when you know it doesn't. There's no point that it drags. It just doesn't. Um, she is she's a master in the true sense of the word. So yeah, yeah. Okay, well I I have sort of um, a question from a reader, but okay, give me a second to kind of work into this one. Um, All right. <laughs> okay, when I was writing this book, as well, um, the character of Belle, you know, she's an extraordinarily angry person. And there were times, you know, I'm writing this character, and she, particularly since I'm having to do this, you know, 24 7 because of the short deadline, where I'm getting angry. You know, it's like I'm, I'm feeling that agitation, and I'm feeling that darkness. And just one night, I had this character, Dave, who was, you know, very country cub perfect in the exterior but inside insecure and fearful and, and dark and there was a lot of darkness there and it was really difficult for me in some ways emotionally to write some of those scenes. Now, for you, when you're preparing for roles, particularly like your role of Bump in Cook County, how do you do that? How do you do that without spiraling into the darkness? I mean, when you're doing these really, really dark roles. I get asked that question a lot, mm -hmm. um, and for me, I you know, I a lot of my a lot of my training comes through what we call clown, but it's not what most people think of when they think of it. when people in this country think of hear clown, they think of circus clowns. Yeah, but it's a French clown is a is a is a French approach to actor training, uh, and I studied under Philippe Gaultier and. Oh wow! And I studied here at Columbia under Gregor Peslowski, who I, is still a very good friend. And the whole idea behind that is approaching a character from the outside in, so that it's it's a very objective shape that you can just step into and inhabit and play. Mm -hmm. And uh, that gels very much with my philosophy of of acting. That acting is a process of play. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called a play. And um, if you're not enjoying what you do, no matter what part you're playing, you should be doing something else. I mean, you know, um, yeah. I would probably make more, you know, most of the years I've been employed, I probably would have made more money being a plumber. And you know. <laughs> Right, so yeah. There's, there's, I, there's no, I don't think that there's any point in, in being a tortured artist. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think that a lot of the actors, particularly in this... Because they don't really have this sense that actors are these shamans that channel these spirits, and it's an emotionally difficult process. <laughs> they don't have that in England. You know, right. somebody goes to the theater and plays Hamlet, and then goes out for a pint of beer with his friends. And nobody asks them, "Are you still Hamlet?" <laughs> Left Hamlet on the stage. Right. So that's that's called craft, right. and that's called that's called being a technician and being an mm -hmm. artist. Um, I think a lot of actors buy into the the idea that they are um, that they are sort of um, um, uh, chal or they're 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 sort of um, part of them is damaged by mm -hmm. a role that they did because it kind of makes them seem more important than they actually are. Oh, yeah. um, it propagates <laughs> it propagates this this absolute myth that I think is it is. Um, detrimental to storytelling, and I think it's detrimental to acting. So uh, I'm very, very, very vociferous on this point. That uh, that's a, I think it's uh, I think most of that is a myth. And no, I had an I had a blast uh, doing Cook County, mm -hmm. other than the weight loss. Right. And, um, you know, if I'm I'm starting to produce more and more, and I can't produce if I'm in character. You got to be able to step out of it and be an adult. And take care of problems. <laughs> right, the rest of your life, yeah. Yeah, but that, that's a great. That was a great question. Thank you. Okay. Um, the other question I was asked um, by Christina Maker um, was, if there was a character um, in a book, is there a character in a book that you would most like to play? I mean, is there from the from your reading, is there something like, oh, I would love to play that part, that character? Oh, um, that's a great, great question. The, the first one that jumps 
out at me is not uh, is actually based on a real is, is a real human being a real person. Um, uh, I, I read a fantastic biography about Rasputin, and I, I would really love to play Rasputin. <sighs> and in about ten or fifteen years, maybe maybe ten years, mm-hmm. I very much want to play John Brown. Oh, cool. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay, I could see that. And and I can see Rasputin. Be an awesome Rasputin. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that somebody like Willem Dafoe doesn't do it right now because he's like. No, no, no. Perfect. You need to save I gotta, that. I gotta, I gotta age a little bit before I can do John Brown. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like you know, there's miracles of makeup, but yeah. But you know, I could, I absolutely, I totally, yeah, Rasputin. That'd be cool. You'd be. <laughs> could be a hot Rasputin. <laughs> 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 well, you know, he, he apparently did quite well with the ladies. Exactly. I know. So there you go. <laughs> uh, what about you? Is there, was there any character that you've read that you would want love to play on stage or in a movie? Oh, let's see. I what mean, about um, that, what about a character you could steal oh, as a role? A character I could steal as a role. Um, you know, there's a few, but one of them uh, certainly is, again, I'm going back to Shakespeare, and I know this is probably a, a typical answer, but you got to love Lady Macbeth. I mean, mm-hmm. oh, my God, you've got to love Lady Macbeth. And, you know, I continually, and I referenced it later in this series, um, you know, with out, out damn spot, you know, I mean, just, just that visual of, you know, that of her ambition, um, and the conflict with what's human guilt, because I mean that whole scene actually implies that she's not completely sociopathic, right? I mean, because the fact that she's actually focused on this um, and dreaming about this, she's a great character. Uh, but then, you know, one of my favorite characters of all time, again going back to Anne Rice, is the vampire Lestat. I mean, oh my God, yeah, like he is. I actually have. Uh, one of my prized possessions is a book um, by the Vampire Lestat that is signed by Anne Rice, given to me um, by Rod, my fiance, for wow. my birthday. That is, yeah, that's, wow. yeah, it's like, I mean, for me, that's like a, a diamond necklace and then some. It's just, I can't even tell you how exciting I was by that. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, that um, that character. Oh, I wish I could have taken that character. Um, I wish I could steal it and just rip him out. Um, then the other character who I really love is from the House of Mirth. Um, Edith Wharton's Lily Bart uh, is a very conflicted, interesting character to me. Who, um, as it's spelled out in the book, um, despises the very thing she covets. You know, she's trying to work her way up in the social ranks, and she, to do so at that time basically means marrying wealth. And she's not really interested in just marrying for wealth. That's not her goal. You know, this whole idea of social climbing in some level doesn't sit well with her, but she's very good at it. She just sabotages herself at the last minute every single time. Mm-hmm. And she was, for me, a very interesting character. That was at the end of that book. That's the first time. The first time I read it, which was in college. First time I ever ended up like crying. You know, so I was like, "What's wrong?" I'm like, "This book is so bad." Yeah. <laughs> so I would love to, yeah, take to to grab Lily Bart. So those three. So what's uh what what's next for you? What do you write? What are you working on next? Well, I am continuing with um, with the Deceptive Innocence series. Um, I'm going to be writing, I am writing another book um, to follow the three novellas that are coming out. Because I have three novellas coming out in this month, in February, and in March, and then there's going to be six months after that, another book, and a full-length book, not a novella, um, and then six months after that, another book. And, you know, I frequently get the question of um, why... Am I breaking these up into novellas? Again, that that is a publisher decision, but I'm, but this is also not something where I'm gonna. I never cut off my books mid scene. I mean, it's like there's some novellas I've heard heard the complaint where you're reading and all of a sudden it feels like, wait, we're stopping here. What? This this you can't stop here. We're in the middle of a story. I try to make them more um, 
like, well, season finale cliffhangers, you know? So it feel there's a sense of completion that there's still something that, you know, compels you to buy the next book. But you still feel like you got a full, complete season. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want each of the books to be. And the story is going to be ongoing. So it's going to be a continuing, a continuing narrative, at least um, for another year or so, of Bell. So, and Lander. Cool. Yeah. Cool. I have a, I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things I'm interested in with artists is, and I, I talked a little bit about this before, uh, about having something other than what you do uh, mm -hmm. that's just for you, uh, that lets you go back to the well in a different kind of way. Um, for me, it's yeah, obviously writing. I I also like to play golf when I'm visiting my mom or I uh, in mm -hmm. one of Canada. So what is it? What is it for you that gets you away from what it is you do that that can help turn things on in a different way? Um, there, there's a couple of things. One is is um, when I'm hiking or taking or going to museums, like and really scenic museums, like um, the Getty Center, um, which is the museum itself and the the gardens and landscape is just yeah. really beautiful and it's centering, and and it moves me. Um, or the art at the LACMA itself, you know, there's there's um, a lot of multicultural art at the LACMA, um, and that you can sort of draw from. Um, I will say that really good filmmaking or or television sometimes um, will also help me. You know, I mean, I can I can kind of escape to it and then be inspired by it um, mm -hmm. almost as much as I can be from a really good book. Um, but in terms of away from the whole creative medium itself, yeah, going to those kind of places where the beauty around me um, inspires me, that's, that's something I sometimes need. Mm. That's my that's wealth. Great. Yeah. So um, I need to get back, back to packing here in a little bit. Uh, yeah? Yeah. I, uh, I just... I, I, Apparently, I just I just bought an apartment about five minutes ago. No, you're um, moving up in the world. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you. So so uh, tell us where, how, when the book is available, how we can get it, and in any me in any medium that we want. And uh, <laughs> okay, so the Subdivenant says you can buy part one right now. It's an ebook. Um, Anywhere where ebooks are sold, basically Barnes Noble, Amazon, Kobo, whatever you're doing, um, and the next part two and part three again in ebook form will be uh, available in the, each month, so February, March. Then in June you'll be able to get the paperback, and at that point you should also be able to get the audiobook. So at that point you'll have all the mediums, you'll have all the choices, and you can pre-order the paperback now. It will be a little bit longer before you'll be able to um, pre-order the the audiobook, um, and I'm hoping to get Gabra Zachman to be reading the audiobook. And people who listen to audiobooks, that will mean something to you. <laughs> um, but she's she's told me that she's very interested. So so yeah, so that's so you can get, you can pre-order it in paperback now, um, Deceptive Innocence, or you can read Deceptive Innocence Part One right now um, as an ebook. Wherever you buy ebooks. Great. Um, is there anything else that you want to ask or, or say or talk about before we take off? Um. Okay. I'm sure this like I know that lots of people wrote me in the questions and so on and so forth. Um, and I don't. I, I can't. Most of them, to be honest, were um, R-rated requests for you. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna skip those. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean. I, I would like really, and I don't know if I can do this really quickly, but I would like to ask, you know, your character on um, Hell on Wheels, mm -hmm. Helen, has gone through major, major changes um, throughout the course of this, this show, um, and each season has sort of really brought very different things. There's been a lot of changes, and um, where do you feel like Colin is going next? I mean, where do, can... Can you share anything? Can you give us any hints I mean, in terms of how you feel like his emotional development or or what he's going to be doing now that he's, you know, he's... Um, 
uh, you know, the writers just got back into the room a, a couple of weeks ago, so that's sort of being figured out right now. All I can say is that the only thing that I know is that regardless of how you end up in that situation that he ended up in at the end of season three, um, when you suddenly find that you're going to have a, a, a human being or a couple of human beings dependent upon you, uh, whether or not you wanted to end up in that situation, it's a very real uh, situation that um, I think anybody who has a heart is going to to, to gravitate towards. And, and, and uh, Cullen, I think, did the honorable thing Thought it was a step for him character-wise. Uh, so I don't know. We just got to see where the writers want to go from here. This is the, my first time doing an arc that, that that's this long. Oh, really? So, uh, that's a, a a kind of craft that I've never really practiced before. So I'm kind of learning as I go. Right. Uh, you, right. Usually my stories are an hour and a half long. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. But with television, television is you have a really quick first act, and then you have a second act that could last six years, and most of them never have a third act. So we know what our third act generally would be just because it has to encompass the end of the Transcon uh, Transcontinental Railroad, but, right. but th that second act, man, that's, it's, uh, it's, it's a lot to figure out. So wow. I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm flying by the seat of my pants and following my gut and trusting my writers and, wow. and supported by a uh, an incredible ensemble cast. Uh, so, and I'm just, I just, I, you know, I just keep going back to the, I keep going back to the, to the, to the, the grindstone of having fun. Just making sure that it's fun, that I'm enjoying it, and my castmates are enjoying it. And I think as long as that's happening, it's going to be okay. Okay. Well, there you go. Well, you got to get you're riding around the horses. It's got to be some fun, you know. So <laughs> I'm spo I'm forever spoiled. I'm never going to be able to shoot a TV show in a studio again. It's a, <laughs> I can see that. It's great. It's great. Oh We're starting earlier this year, though, so it's going to be it's going to be quite cold in California. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, hopefully they'll you know you'll get the the cool leather ja the cool jackets and the whole you know and the facial hair and <laughs> all the things you need to keep you warm. <laughs> so hey, why don't we try to do this again uh, when the second part of your of your trilogy comes out? That would be fantastic. I would love that. Great. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me, and yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank and you. good luck with the unpacking and you know making your House of home. <laughs> right. I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna be coming out there uh, in a couple of weeks. So and oh. I know that I've got plans to, to see to see Rod and maybe we should uh, we should hang out. Absolutely, I would love that. Okay, Very cool. cool. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye, bye everyone. <laughs> bye. Bye.